Welcome to the road to the Gator Bowl. Tomorrow afternoon, the Gamecocks face Notre Dame at 3.30 inside the home of the Jacksonville Jaguars. TIAA Bank Field is where the Gamecocks hope to cap off a season with a three-game winning streak. All three victories will be coming over high-profile programs. And we will get you ready for kickoff in the next 30 minutes with an in-depth interviews. Also, a look at what Jacksonville has to offer. So stick around. It's going to be fun. We'll go ahead and jump right into what went down earlier today in Jacksonville as both head coaches took their turn at the podium for the final pregame news conference. Shane Beamer wrapping up his second season in Columbia. Boy, does he have a chance to end the season with one of the most unexpected yet dramatic finishes in the history of Gamecock football. Carolina has a chance to close out 2022 with victories over Tennessee, Clemson, and Notre Dame, three marquee opponents. And it's a roster for this game it looks a lot different in now in December than it did in November, but the guys who are in Jacksonville are certainly battle tested. We've got some guys that played meaningful snaps against Clemson, but w that aren't here. But I just look around our room and I see a whole bunch of dudes that have made a ton of plays for us this season that are here. Uh, we're here to focus on the game ahead. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so worrying about worrying about our preparation and getting ready for the game. You know, we've been just helping these guys. They're great, great ball players. They've been showing up throughout practice and just bringing their confidence along, you know, showing them the way and, you know, knowing that they'll make plays for us on Saturday. It's certainly different, but it's uh, it's exciting, too. And and uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, guys that have done a lot of great things for us this season that will continue to go tomorrow, hopefully, too. Well, it's roughly four and a half hours drive time on paper. Sometimes that's not that reality, but four and a half hours roughly from Richland County to Duval County. So no surprise, a lot of Gamecock fans spending their post Christmas activities in Jacksonville. And that's where we find our Sam Perez, who gives us a look at how the Garnet and Black contingent looking to take over North Florida's coastal city. Sam. Reggie, we are here at a pep rally. Uh, we're at the tail end of it, and Gamecocks fans have been gathering to celebrate. Now, things are not just getting started, but South Carolina fans have been here celebrating all day. That is the sound of pure joy coming from Carolina Nation in the River City. Gamecocks have come in and taken over Jacksonville this week. Wes Hickman is the president of the USC Alumni Association. He's been working to prepare for fans from all over. We got people coming out of Chicago, Tampa, Charleston, Orlando, and Columbia themselves. And everybody's coming right down here to host. Ah, oh, it's so great to be, be able to host everybody here. And everyone really has shown out. We always, always, me and my best friend and my family. Yeah, our first thought when we saw everyone, we were like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, we, our fan base definitely showed out for this game. From cheerleaders like Vanessa Cooper to cocky and more alumni, thousands of fans are in Jacksonville for the Gator Bowl. Keep the faith, because we're going to win. And they're decked out in their Gamecocks gear. I'm going to start crying. I can't even explain the feeling. Like, just to represent and have Carolina on your chest is, like, absolutely such a blessing. That feeling can be summed up in just three words. I'm awesome, mind-blowing, and Gamecocks. Go Cox! Yes, go Gamecocks. Praise God. Uh, Now, the pep rally has kind of wrapped up, but there are still people around. The energy is high, and you can feel the excitement. Tomorrow, there's a tailgate at Metropolitan Spark Park starting at 1130, and another pep rally starting at 230 right before the game. Reporting live in Jacksonville, Sam Perez, News 19 WLTX. All right, Sam, thank you. Hey, this is TIAA Bank Field, the site for the Gator Bowl. It sits near the St. John's River and this stadium also serves as the site for the annual rivalry game between Florida and Georgia. It also hosted Super Bowl 39 and again it's also the home of the Jacksonville Jaguars who are currently in first place in the AFC South. This week the Jaguars sent out ticket information for a potential home playoff game. So there is a lot of excitement in the city. It's got some buzz and this Gator Bowl will be a part of a big sports weekend in Duval County and inside the stadium the crew putting the finishing touches on the field. The logos are in place. Now earlier today as we said Notre Dame also meeting the media. Obviously, Marcus Freeman has done a great job up there in South Bend. He brings an 8 and 4 team into Jacksonville. And the Fighting Irish, well aware of what the Gamecocks have accomplished those last few weeks in November. Obviously, they're hot at this moment, and so you're going to know they're going to come in confident, and you're going to know that you're gonna, they're going to come in with that kind of swagger. You, you want to prepare to play the best, right? They're, what you've seen them put on film, 
being their best. And I think the last two games, they've shown that they can beat any team in the country. And so that's our preparation. That's our challenge. We're saying that's the team we're going to face, and uh, we'll see what, what happens tomorrow. But that's what our pre mental preparation has to be. Well, Spencer Rattler certainly can cap off his first season at South Carolina with a massive three game winning streak. He's had an up and down season until he and the entire team caught fire in late November. And our Chandler Mack joins us now from Jacksonville. And Chandler, what more can you tell us about the Gamecocks high profile number seven? Yeah, Reggie, you know, after throwing for 438 yards in the 25 point win against Tennessee and then following that up by leading the Gamecocks to a 14 point rallying from a 14 point deficit to beat Clemson for the first time in nine years, it would have been an understood decision for Spencer Rattler to decide to opt out playing in the Gator Bowl. But if you have followed his journey from Oklahoma to South Carolina, you would know the same thing that he told me, that his love for Shane Beamer and his teammates made the decision to play tomorrow a no-brainer. Here's a look at Spencer Rattler's first season as a Gamecock. You know, it was important for me because, you know, Coach Beamer has been great to me all year. He, for him even bringing me here, it was, was a blessing. So the least I, least I could do was play in the bowl game. So I had to do it for him, the coaching staff, and obviously the players as well. Around this time last year, Spencer Rattler's college football career was at a crossroads. Despite posting a 15-2 record as a starter with the Sooners, Rattler was benched in his final season in Norman and traded in his crimson and white colors for garnet and black, becoming one of the biggest signees in Gamecock history. I feel totally just refreshed, you know, to be at a new university, a great university like this. You know, I feel a sense of, you know, I'm very comfortable here. While Rattler may have been comfortable in Columbia, his play on the field through the first eight games reflected the opposite. He had just seven touchdowns and nine interceptions during the Gamecocks five and three start. Uh, you know, it's just part of the game, you know, especially being a quarterback and, you know, being in a new system with a new team, new coaches and, uh, you know, but we, but we got through it. We won the big games that mattered. Nothing mattered more to Spencer and Gamecock Nation than how he finished his first regular season as a Gamecock. Back-to-back -to -back top 10 wins, which included a program record six touchdown performance against the Vols. You know, we, we changed a lot of stuff on how we called plays. You know, we limited our personnel groups, not limiting stuff. You know, we're very smart players, very smart offense, but uh, just did what we're best at. We got a lot of playmakers. We just went out there and, and played. The team that beat Tennessee and Clemson is a bit different from the squad that's in Jacksonville. The Gamecocks are without 11 players that started in the Clemson game, but Rattler feels the team has everything it needs to beat the Fighting Irish. We got some young guys that are hungry to make plays. We got guys that are experienced here that, you know, wanted to finish this thing out right. Um, so, you know, we're excited about the opportunity. It's a big bowl game, and, you know, we're going to go make South Carolina proud. Yeah, and if Spencer throws for over 300 yards against the Fighting Irish tomorrow, get this, he would become just the fourth quarterback in Gamecock history to eclipse the 300-yard passing mark on four different occasions in a single season. Reggie, he would join Steve Tannehill, Steven Garcia, and Todd Ellis on that list. Certainly not bad company, am I right? Absolutely not. Uh, quite a marquee list of quarterbacks right there. Thanks, Chairman. Look forward to seeing you later in our broadcast. Well, this 2022 season for the Gamecocks had plenty of ups and downs, and going to the podium every week has given Shane Beamer the opportunity to make his case for the state of his program or deliver a message to the public. Here's the best of Beamer's sound bites from the regular season. Check it out. Sorry, I'm a minute or too late. I was talking to Juice. He was telling me how these bright lights made him nervous. Uh, up here just a minute ago and I told him that I had to come in here and take these questions for these tough questions for 30 minutes and he uh, uh, has a newfound level of respect for me I think you sense any give up in the locker room hell no what kind of questions that Phil um, we're one and two we're one and two we got a bunch of fighters in that room and uh, and give up that's not a part of this football program just so proud of their fight um, they never flinch uh, and it's a, it's a really, really special group of kids in that locker room and really happy for them. It was a, uh, just a little over a month ago, I sat in here after the Georgia game and got asked, did I sense any quit in this football team? That looked like that team's quit. So since that day, 
We've won four straight for the first time since 2013. We just beat uh, Texas, or, uh, who did we beat? Kentucky on the road two weeks ago up in Lexington for the first time since 2012. And we just beat Texas A&M for the first time ever. So, no, there's no quit in this team. We've got a bunch of freaking fighters on this team that love each other and play for one another and care about each other, and it showed out there uh, tonight. As ugly as it was at Tom's, they never flinched, and they just kept coming back, and we talked about we're a second-half team, and we get better as the game goes, and we did. Like, we were the feel-good story in college football last week, but nobody thought we were good enough to win this game. We were the team that just kind of caught lightning in a bottle last week, and no way they can come back and do it again. When we took care of business last week, it wasn't just, okay, we did it great. No, we planned on doing it two in a row, and we did. Well, special teams usually don't get a lot of attention unless that unit is really, really good or really, really bad. Well, boy, is Pete Limbo made special teams at South Carolina really special. Carolina finished second in the nation in block punts, third in punt returns, fifth in net punting, and Gamecock punter Kai Kroger was named All-SEC, and kicker Mitch Jeter had a 100% conversion rate on field goals. Now, Limbo was a semifinalist for the Broyles Award, which goes to college football's top assistant coach. And in his second year at Carolina, he recently earned a new contract that will take him through 2025 with a deal that is worth $725,000 per year. And at some point, you got to figure Limbo will get another head coaching job following up his stints at Lehigh, Elon, and Ball State. But it will take a lot to pry him away from Columbia. I really felt good about Shane and about coming here uh, two years ago, and I really felt good about how we would be committed to the cause and, and make special teams a priority here, and, and everything has is, is lived up to that. Um, and aside from the football stuff, it's the people. It's, it's every layer of it. It's the, it's the, the people that in our neighborhood. It's the... It's the alums of this university. It's the fans of this university. It's the athletic administration. It's um, the faculty. It's the staff. It's obviously the people in this building that you get to work with every day. So, um, you know, there's, you, you know when something feels right and you know when it's fulfilling to come to work every day. And this has certainly been that. And, um, and you know, to see the administration and Shane being proactive about uh, trying to keep us here, that, that just is kind of the, the, the cherry on top to everything. Yeah, special teams coordinators, strength coaches, those are the unsung heroes that don't, don't get a lot of attention, but boy, uh, they are certainly very invaluable as Pete Limbo is a living proof of that. All right, the road to the Gator Bowl continues here on News 19. Stay with us. All right, back here on the road to the Gator Bowl, getting you ready for tomorrow afternoon's contest between the Gamecocks and the Fighting Irish. And that road to the Gator Bowl includes this guy right here, Andrew Lyon from Locked On Gamecocks and Gamecocks Digest. And Andrew, I was generally excited when this Gator Bowl matchup appeared because for the Gamecocks, they've got some history of this bowl game. And it's kind of neat to go to a bowl game, again, with so much tradition. And Carolina will try to win, obviously, uh, down there for the first time. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you look at this game, you know, the two words that can be thrown out there the most are momentum and opportunity. South Carolina obviously finished off the regular season quite well against Tennessee and Clemson. And then, of course, had a really solid recruiting class, objectively speaking, this past week that they secured. And now they're going to have an opportunity against one of the biggest brands in all college football in the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Yes, folks, they might be eight and four, but that ND still holds a lot of weight in this sport. And if South Carolina can find a way to get a win against the Fighting Irish down there in Jacksonville, it would go a long ways towards giving themselves even more more momentum heading into 2023. Yeah, you talk about finishing 2022 with three monumental victories. Okay, who's calling plays? I would say Shane Beamer. I think that because of the fact he doesn't have any specific on-field responsibilities that Shane Beamer could handle being the offensive play caller for a one-game basis. And, of course, he's reiterated multiple times to the media that it's going to be collective effort in terms of developing a game plan between all the offensive staff members. Of course, there might be some other guys that could also be well-suited to take that spot. But I think that at the end of the day, it makes more sense for the head coach to take that role in the Gator Bowl. Well, my choice for interim offensive coordinator would be Justin Stepp because just a couple of weeks ago, his twin brother Josh was the play caller for Louisville. They've actually had a coaching change up there, and it worked out pretty well as the Cardinals won their bowl game with Josh calling plays. So that would be my vote, but uh, again, I don't think I've got a whole lot of weight. Uh, anyway, meanwhile, as far as the Gamecocks are concerned, you've got a chance to end the season again with three huge wins to go nine and four. Obviously, that sounds a lot better than eight and five, but you know, how did this team do it? 
when just a couple of weeks ago it seemed like they're going to be headed out to the uh, Las Vegas Bowl. I think what it says is you can never throw in the towel on a team in the middle of the season. Obviously, they definitely had their bumps in the road. You look at early on in the year, they lost back-to-back -back games against two good teams in Arkansas and Georgia. Of course, they later on dropped some games against Missouri and Florida, some real head scratchers to the fan base. And especially after that Florida game, South Carolina Bailey did look like they were almost dead in the water, but they revitalized themselves. They went back. They made, they made some adjustments, and they found a way to get it done against two of the better programs in all of college football in Tennessee and Clemson. So, again, when you have enough talent and you have a team that is close enough, as Shane Beamer has said multiple times in the past, it shows that you can come back and bounce back against some of the biggest of odds uh, in the eyes of the media and the fans of college football. And that's exactly what the Gamecocks did at the end of the regular season. Okay, let's get right down to it. Tomorrow afternoon, Gamecocks and Fighting Irish. South Carolina has obviously never won the Gator Bowl. They played in the first Gator Bowl, too, back in 1946. Their last appearance in Jacksonville in 1987. Todd Ellis will be calling the game on the uh, radio for the Gamecocks. And obviously, he was the quarterback back in 1987, so perhaps this is the Todd Ellis Bowl. But what goes down, in your opinion? Does Carolina get that first Gator Bowl victory against Notre Dame? Reggie, I think they do. I think it's going to be certainly a close game. Obviously, Notre Dame, even though they're 8-4, still have a really talented ball club with some really solid guys on both sides of the ball. I just think at the end of the day, South Carolina's got the better quarterback situation. Spencer Rattler, of course, has been in fuego over the last couple of games, and I think that despite the fact there's been a bit of a break, he will carry that over into this contest. I think he'll find just enough of an offensive flow with some of these maybe newer guys on the edge offensively. And then defensively, I think South Carolina will find a way to slow down that ground game enough for Notre Dame and force them to have to try to air the ball out, which I don't think would be very advantageous for the Fighting Irish. So you incorporate all that with some Beamer ball. I think the Gamecocks went by a final score of 27 to 24. All right, there you go. So he is Andrew Lyon from Locked On Gamecocks and Gamecocks Digest. Thank you for your coverage throughout the year on Gamecock Extra. Thank you for helping us put a little bow here on the 2022 campaign. And the road to the Gator Bowl continues here on News 19. reporting live in Jacksonville. I'm here at the Seawalk Pavilion where Gamecocks fans are celebrating in preparation of tomorrow's Gator Bowl. Now this is the 78th year that Jacksonville is hosting the game, so I wanted to learn more. Well, it means a lot. The Gator Bowl, it's been held in Jacksonville every year since 1946. Just for the city and the community, it's become a, a staple event. Now it's an attraction that brings thousands of football fans like Mustin Capassi coming from Spartanburg in an RV to the Sunshine State each year. I have heard from people that I haven't heard from in years that are going to this game. But it wasn't always this way. The Gator Bowl started as a way to liven up downtown Jacksonville after the holidays as soldiers returned home after World War II. The Lions Club headed up the campaign to fundraise. Both the Lions Club mean a lot to me and of course the Gamecocks mean a lot to me. As a Lions Club member himself, Mustin says the history of the game is special. I couldn't even tell you how much they mean to me. He's not the only one who feels that way. Greg McGarrity, CEO of the Gator Bowl, tells me. This game means so much too because it kind of fills a void uh, between the NFL games on Sundays usually. Carolina hadn't been here since 87 and Notre Dame since 2003, so two teams hadn't been here for a while and fan bases likewise. As McGarrity said, this is not South Carolina's first time at the Gator Bowl. South Carolina actually went against Wake Forest in the very first match of the Gator Bowl in 1946. Reporting live in Jacksonville, Sam Perez, News 19 WLTX. All right, Sam, thank you very much. Yeah, you just mentioned the Gamecocks last appeared in the Gator Bowl back in 1987. The Gamecocks facing LSU, Joe Morrison versus Mike Archer, who was the head coach at LSU. CBS actually broadcast the game. A rough day on that day, though, for the Gamecocks as LSU defeated Carolina 30 to 13. So on the season, Carolina finished 8 and 4 into the season, ranked 15th in the final Associated Press top 25. LSU finished 5th. And as we mentioned earlier, Todd Ellis, the voice of Gamecock football, he was the quarterback for that team for the Gamecocks, the uh, very familiar uh, number nine that uh, Todd wore as a Gamecock quarterback. So again, LSU and the Gamecocks back in 1987. It's been a while since Carolina was part of this prestigious bowl and they're back in it for 2022. All right, the road to the Gator Bowl continues here on News 19. Stay with us.
Welcome back to our Road to the Gator Bowl special. I'm Chandler Mack, live right here in Jacksonville, Florida. Well, folks, we all know bowl games are supposed to have a program in their season on a high note, but they also provide fans and local residents an opportunity to meet some of the best college football players in the country. And today, Shane Beamer, along with some of his team captains, got a chance to put smiles on the faces of several Jacksonville kids. It was, I, I loved it. It was like so fun. I got to meet somebody and they, and now, well, they're my friend. Jude Kelly and his fellow Dream Team members made some Gamecock friends today. Shane Beamer and Carolina's team captains took pictures with and signed autographs for the Dream Team, a group of 12 children that are battling life-altering illnesses. It was really cool meeting all of them and talking to them one-on-one -on -one and getting their signatures. For some of these kids, they'll never be able to play sports um, because of the different things that they've been going through. And so they really get to, to be on a team that they would never be on and kind of live vicariously through these teams. The Dreams Come True organization has been partnering with the Gator Bowl for the last five seasons. And during the first quarter tomorrow, the kids will get a chance to be on the field. So meeting the Gamecocks today was just the start of what is expected to be an amazing Gator Bowl experience for the Dream Team. It gives us something to look forward to and make us happy in hard times. And to see how Coach Beamer just really got down with them and talking SpongeBob and sports, and it's really so fun to see these kids really get to, to be kids. And that's what we really want is for these kids to have hope and joy. Yeah, one of Shane Beamer's favorite catchphrases all season was find some joy in Reggie. He certainly gave those kids some joy today. Signing off from Jacksonville, Florida, Chandler Mack, News 19, WLTX. All right, Chandler, thank you very much, and thank you for watching our Road to the Gator Bowl special. Again, 3.30 kickoff tomorrow afternoon in Jacksonville between the Gamecocks and the Fighting Irish. Again, TIWA AA Bank Field. It's all quiet now. It won't be quiet tomorrow. Hey, we'll see you tonight on News 19 at 11. Thanks for watching.